forever and ever and ever. Father, we come before you in the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you for this day. We thank you for your many blessings. We thank you for your hand upon us. You spirit lead and guide us. We thank you, Father, if your word's true. And we know that it is that you loved us and you had a plan for us before we was ever formed in our mother's womb. So we just thank you, Father, right now in the mighty name of Jesus, Father, that this day, as we step into this service, you knew the times and the seasons we're living in today many years ago. Tomorrow, wherever we're headed, Father, you're there before we get there if we follow your will, plan, and purpose. So, Father, we come to you this morning in this church very humbly and reverently, knowing, Father, that you're the one that knows all things, but we've been given the Holy Spirit that will lead God and direct us, Father, into all truth, Father. And he will show us everything that's necessary for our lives to be successful concerning the future, tomorrow and beyond. So right now, we just yield to you by the Spirit of God. And I thank you, Father, as I stand here today, that the words that I minister, the words that I speak, will not be man's plans, thoughts, or ideas, but will be what thus saith the Spirit of God to these people, Father. We believe that just as I've come this morning, they've all come expecting to receive by faith from you all that you want to say and do. They're going to receive this word that's given today fresh off the press from heaven. They're going to leave here and apply it. And we thank you, Father, they'll never be the same. Their lives will be changed forever. Now, Father, we depend upon the Holy Spirit this morning to lead God and direct us. You're the only one, as we said, that knows the state of every heart. You know the troubles. You know the opposition. You know the havoc the devil's trying to wreak in the lives of the people that will hear this message this morning. So again, you know the word from your word. They need to know the anointing. The power and presence of God that needs to be present this morning to minister to the people in this place. It's not our will and plan, but yours. We surrender to you. So this morning, through the Word and the Spirit, we thank you that you're ministering to the people. We thank you, Father, as we've said, their lives will be changed forever. But we thank you above all else, all the said and done. We'll give you the glory, the honor, and praise you so deserve. We thank you for it now. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You can be seated at this time. Thank God for the Word. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank God for the way that He's been moving and going to continue to move as we trust Him together. Do you believe that God is with you? Yes. You need to believe it because the Bible says so. Read Psalms 46 for yourself. And you have opportunity. But thank God that God is with us. And again, if the Bible is true, it is. He's not only with us, He's in us. And greater is He that's in me, greater is He that's in you, than He that's in this world. So whatever you face in this world today, Whatever you face in this world, tomorrow, God is greater. You may come to places that seem like there's no way. Seem like there's no way you can make it. Seem like you're going under instead of over. And when I say that, because it's for somebody here, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. We'll start in verse 8. I ministered this before, talked about it before, but I'm going to say it now. Very often you can get to a place where it looks like it's the end and you think this is the end, this is over. There's no hope, there's no future, and there's no way out. I have found from personal experience, I have found from counseling and working with other people, and I found primarily from the Word of God, that just because it looks like the end to you today, just because it looks like there's no hope to you today, it doesn't mean that there's no way. It doesn't mean there's no future, it doesn't mean God has no plan, and it doesn't mean there's no way out of the devil's plan that he may have been endeavoring to implement in your life. Right? For some, it's time to run the devil out. You can, and you will. Right? But 2 Corinthians chapter 1, one of my favorite passages, Paul talking, verse 8, he said, We would not, brother, have you ignorant. It means we want you to know of our trouble. Very true, we abide in Christ, produce the fruit of the Spirit. You can stay not only steady in the storm, he that believes, he that's in faith is entered into God's rest. You can have rest and peace in the storm, right? And there's a something called the joy of faith, which is, of course, you abide in the vine, part of the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace. You can have joy unspeakable, full of glory in the middle of the storm. But it's a truth that the storm may come upon you. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, the Bible says, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. You're going to face some things. 
And as much as you love God and endeavor to follow His plan for your life, there's a real devil. We're not here to blow him up or give him credit today. For in, in Christ Jesus, he's defeated. He's under our feet. But he will always be endeavoring to encroach over and trespass and get in your life in, in the areas that only God's supposed to be. He always is endeavoring uh, to do those things, right? So he said here, Brother, we would not have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of our life. They was in a bad way. To the point, verse 9 says, we have the sentence of death in ourselves. When you get the sentence of death, it's over. Far as you're concerned, far as you know, far as you can see. We have the sentence of death in ourselves. But there's a revelation in this passage. There's a revelation in these couple statements. We have the sentence of death in ourselves, so we gave up, so we planned our funeral, so we said it's over. So we said there's no hope. Is that what it says? No. We have the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves. So they come to an end. They come to a place where a sentence of death would be there. But they simply took that. As Paul talked about Philippians 3 himself, having no confidence in the flesh. Who we are, what we are, what we can do. Not in Christ, but obviously apart from Christ. Our ability. That we should not trust in ourselves, but where? And, and again, this goes with the message this morning. Many people have thought many things in their lives were bad at the time. And maybe you still haven't seen it. Some things that God brought people through, I know even us, to and then through, may have looked bad at the moment. But the reality of it is, because of where we are today, and even what's to come in this world where you live, God's been endeavoring to prepare you and position you to be prepared, obviously, to accomplish His purpose in this environment that we live in. Because I said it's not doubt and unbelief. I'm going to say some things this morning by the Spirit of God. But the reality of it is, it's the truth of God's Word. There's not a promise in the Bible that this world system out here is going to offer you more hope the closer you get to the end. Or that it's going to get better. The Bible says it's going to wax worse and worse. That's what the Bible says. But many Christians have a hope in the world. And the reality of it is, it's a false hope. I'm not saying there's not things we can do or should do. And again, what I used to people ask me, what you think, you just don't have to do anything though. I just don't believe in doing what most Christians do. I don't bypass God in the doing process. Most people do a lot of stuff, but it's not in God's direction. You can do all kind of stuff. People say, well, whatever I put my hand to prospers. No, that ain't the Bible. That's a half-truth. Whatever you put your hand to that God has led God and directed you to, He blesses His plans, not our plans. And we've come to some times and some hard times and dealt with some things, but the purpose of it was so that we would come to the end of ourselves. So that we would have faith and trust in God. To depend upon Him. To do in and through us what we could never do alone. In the world, is fixing to get worse than ever before. And I'm not telling you this message. My family knows this. But you don't know because you don't live with me. I'm not telling you this message because I read and watch all the news. But because I see God every single day. And listen to what the Spirit of God says. And I know what He's showing me in the Bible. Matter of fact, I had a message this morning. God's plan for your prosperity. That message is for the hour. The law of sowing and reaping and then seed time and harvest is going to be necessary for you to know and understand to be successful in these days and times. You're going to have to know what to do. This whatever happens, happens in this environment of a world that we're living in will bring utter destruction to you. We're moving into more serious times than we've ever been before. Amen? I ministered many months back. I went back in my notebook, but I didn't go far enough to find it. I ministered a message by the Spirit of God on a Sunday morning, and the title of it was, The Flood is Coming. Minister one this morning, the Lord changed the whole message, and the title of it is, The Flood is Here. So why did you minister that? Well, the Lord told you it's coming for a long, long time. 
Matter of fact, what I'm ministering today, the Lord's been dealing with me about, speaking to me about, and I minister on occasion for the last 15 to 20 years, and that's no exaggeration. He prepares, warns, and equips us ahead of time if we'll listen to Him. But very often, we've not taken things seriously. We say, well, the flood's bad. No. The flood, just like the harvest, is either good or bad. We thank God, the Bible says, in the last days, God will pour out His Spirit upon all flesh. Young men see visions, old men see dreams. We have to thank God. Prophecy, testimony, all kind of good things taking place in the body of Christ. The former and latter rain coming together. That's the flood for God's people. Right? The flood was good or bad when Noah built the ark. Depending upon whether you was in the ark or not. He said, well, there's no natural flood coming, no water coming. The Lord said He wouldn't flood the earth again. I didn't say it was. But that ark was in the world, so to speak, but not of the world. It was a type and shadow. Right? And we know that Noah and those in the ark, all those because of his obedience, even looking foolishly, he didn't look like a fool when it started raining. And God's been endeavoring to prepare us for what's to come. I say this without hesitation. And not to scare you. Not to hinder your faith, but to encourage your faith. Trust God. Trust God. Because in the world, the worst is yet to come. God is always good. For the Lord is good and His mercy endures forever. God is always good. One or two things are going to happen in people's lives. You're going to see the people that trust God walk with God in a greater measure and stick out like a sore thumb like they never have before. Or you're going to see those that don't trust God very often enter into unnecessary destruction. We're going to trust God. We're going to follow God. We don't want to be caught off guard. We don't want to be caught unawares. I was right down the road yesterday. Me and Arlene was talking. And again, it wasn't many years ago this would apply to me, not just other people. But I told Arlene, I said, you know, I've come to learn and see. And again, this was just as much for me in the past. It's not today, but it used to be. I said, from the Bible, I've come to learn and understand that most Christians don't trust God because they never had to. Our country has been such a prosperous place that you get your education, get your degree or whatever you do, get your job and your family, and, and, and really you never had to focus too much on the source, which is God. Focus on the instrument or the means that was used, which is job or whatever it may be. And people haven't had to trust God. Those times are gone. So I want to go to this church over here where you're going to get caught off guard because you're not going to be prepared. Because the time's coming either way. So you can go somewhere where they're giving you coffee and donuts this morning. But that's not going to help you. You need the truth of God's Word. Yes, amen. The Lord said this concerning the church. And i got more scripture here I can preach, but I'm just telling you what the Spirit of God's saying. He's endeavoring to prepare us because we've not been prepared. Because just like you take a child and bring them up through the years and you think you're doing a good thing because you cater to them. You spoil them and give them everything they want instead of discipline them. It's been their way and if they don't get their way, they cry a little bit and you just do whatever they want. You, that they want. That's what you do. Well, anybody that knows the Bible knows that may be fine for just about 15, 16, 18 years. But when they get out here in this world, they're not going to be prepared. They're not going to be ready. It's going to bring shame. It's going to bring embarrassment. Humiliation is going to bring many things because that child was not prepared for this world. The Lord said this to me yesterday. He said the church is in much the same situation. It has been spoiled. They've got by with many things because of the times and the seasons and the atmosphere that we've lived in. But now we're going to trust God or be in trouble. Thank God we're getting to trust God. It's not a have to, we get to. God is with us. But if you never have been before, no matter where you are, you say, this is a message of condemnation. I don't care if you made every decision in your life horrible to get to where you're at today. God is merciful. He'll forgive you. And you can make decisions and He will help you to come out of where you're at. That's what we live, breathe, teach, preach. We want messed up people here. Yeah. Yeah. 
not the same messed up. But come in and the Word and the Spirit of God help you become who God's called you to become. God is with us. But this is not a, a, a Sunday morning and a Wednesday evening proclamation. This is a daily walk. This is trusting Him daily. Are we going to shine brighter than ever before for the Lord Jesus Christ? Because our faith is in Him just as much on Monday at 12 as it is Sunday morning at 10. Yes, we are. As a minister of this today, I am not talking to the conservative Republican. I'm not talking to the liberal Democrat. And I'm not talking to the independent. Stop looking the man to straighten this mess out. It's not going to happen. Yeah. Ah, I just don't believe that. Well, as I tell you all the time, you can believe that wall's black, but it's not. It's not true just because you believe it. You've got to find out what God said and believe it. That's what brings things to pass. Right? I'm not even talking to Americans. We need a revelation. We're talking to Christians. You're in Christ Jesus. Right? We live in this world, but not of this world. God's been warning us for several years. What was to come, and now we are there. If you've been caught off guard, the only reason would be because you have not listened. Or maybe you've been listening to the wrong report. The flood has been coming, but now it is here. What's been going on? And I'm sure there's many that's been doing the same thing and all this kind of stuff. That's other people's business. But God has been preparing us. I can name a, a list of messages that long, but we've heard about making our move, making our decisions. It's because God's been endeavoring to position us, right, perfectly to accomplish His purpose. We've heard about building your faith. Many things came and people were saying, do this and do that and just hold on. And the Holy Ghost spoke with me and said, that is not the message to my people. He said, it is by faith that you overcome every obstacle that comes in your life. Tell my people to build their faith. Tell my people to build feet on the Word. We're not holding on to the back of the chair and hope we make it on the other side. Amen. Amen. If necessary, in the name of Jesus, we're going to walk on the water. Yes. Right? You can have peace in the storm. Yes. 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 Sustenance in the drought and famine. Yes. yes. So the Bible says, He's been teaching us. We've been getting into things about finances. Give. You need that now. And you're going to need it greater. Give and it shall be given to you. Why? He said, tell my people, make sure they got the seed in the ground. Because when things happen like they're happening, they're going to increase in this world. You can remember what God said. Not something you went through the motions on, but hey, we got seed in the ground. Amen. The life is in the seed. Yes, Everything I need is in the seed. I planted the seed of God's Word. I thank God for the harvest. The, the Word of God is not subject to anything out here. The life's in the, in the seed that you plant. It's in the seed of the Word of God. Right? Move. And many have made moves to get or stay in the will of God. Many have made moves to get out of the will of God. That's not good, but still. Positions now for protection and provision or we can be out of the will of God and it's costly. Right? 2 Timothy 3 verse 1. We're going to talk today, next week, I don't know. 2 Timothy 3, verse 1, we just follow the Holy Ghost. Follow the Lord. God wants you prepared. God wants you equipped. Briefly, I would say, whatever God says. We'll talk about America. We'll talk about Christians, but two classes. The carnal worldly Christian and the Christian that is believing and, and trusting God, walking in the will of God. 2 Timothy 3, verse 1. And we need to understand, you say, are you against the country? Of course not. That's, that's ignorant. I'm not against the country, but it doesn't mean that I'm not speaking the truth of God's Word if you can't open your eyes and see that for many years now the country has not been headed in the direction of God, then you're blind. And you just can't see. Spiritually, and I know there's people that are deceived and can't see. Their eyes are blinded, but still, it doesn't matter. America is the world. It is not the church. The church are those in Christ. The world are those outside of Christ. I told you Wednesday night. People are this all split up on everything. That's how the devil operates. Split up on gender, split up on race, split up on classes, split up on all kind of stuff. There's only two families in this earth. It's the family of God. I never talk about it because I think that's how stupid it is. But Carlos is up here taking up the offer. You say Carlos is a black fellow. What is it? What's your other? Where you come from? What's your daddy? Puerto Rican? Whatever he is. You say what is he? I don't care. It don't mean nothing to me. You talk about how color Carlos is, I don't give a rip what color he is. 
Me and Carlos are buddies and we're brothers in Christ. That's the way I treat him. That's the way he treats me. That's the way I am at the house. My whole family knows that. Matter of fact, not only that, that's the way I've raised. I've had people say, well, everybody's a racist. They just do it behind the scenes. You're a liar. Amen. I said, you're a liar. Whoever says that about me and my family, I was raised in the things that are said about black people. I have never heard one time in my life from my parents, not hit a hammer, not somebody cut them off, not even a mistake. Not one time. Never. I wasn't raised that way. We grew up together. We went to church together. And my dad was a pastor. And when other white people were in the church, because we had whites and blacks, when white people were in the church, then one would get out line and say something. Even if he didn't address it then, we got in the truck and he'd say, now boys, I need to talk to you. That's not how we live. And that's not what God likes. And we got taught that way. Then today, everybody's a racist. That's not true. All white people don't hate all black people. All black people don't hate all white people. And all different ones, hate brown and all. Everybody different colors. God looks at the heart. That's why you say, well, you ought to preach on that stuff more. It's too stupid to preach on. If we'll preach Jesus, we have unity and peace. It's the only way you're going to get it. You preach the answer. You don't preach your problem. Jesus is the answer. He is our peace. He's our unity. He's our sanctification. He's our redemption. He's our everything. We preach Christ unto them just like Paul did. That's the answer. Amen. People's talking about a lot of stuff and only making the divide wider than ever before. Right? We're not going to do that. And you have these things come through the news which are satanic and the evil report. You say, well, some of these things are true. They might report on them as true, but the highest truth is God's Word, not what the news says. It may be right in what's going on at the moment, but there's a higher truth, and it's God's Word. He said, my Word is truth. What God said, we're only going to rise above what we preach, teach, and speak. And that's what we're going to live by is the Word of God. That's why we're coming up. No matter who's going down, you and I are coming up because we live by the Word. Amen. Right? The Word straightens out every mess you got. All of it. Did it straighten this country out? Straighten any country out. 2 Timothy 3 verse 1. In that, what the King James says, we can read all of them, but I'm not going to for the sake of time. This note in the last days, perilous times shall come. In the Amplified, it says this, but understand this, that in the last days will come, this is why I like it, because it just defines it, talking about the times we're living in before the rapture of the church, it says, in the last days will come set in perilous times of great stress and trouble, hard to deal with and hard to bear. And the picture of it, if you study this out, is sometimes, you know, you, you can really think about this as a child, is it, it, when you're children, you don't care as much today. If you get an adult, just like yesterday, my yard had been so crusty and dry, I wanted it to rain. And I know with us making do with air conditioning, I knew to cool things down. But as a child, they want to go outside and play. That rain comes and it just sets in. And Granny used to say, well, boys, y'all don't know when y'all going to be able to go back outside because it looks like this one is set in. What that means is this here to stay for a while. Right? The times that you're living in are set in. God hadn't changed. Christ hadn't changed. And the Word still works. But the times that you're living in have set in. And they're going to get worse until the church is raptured out of there. Say, so, well, I want to get this so bad. Well, we're hinders of lawlessness. So the Bible says the devil is limited to a degree. To a degree. He should be limited to much more of a degree. If the church rose up and took his authority and believed the Word instead of the world, but he's limited in what he can do because of you and me. Right? Just like in my house, he's limited in what he can do because we have authority. But I don't have authority at your house. But, but we get over into the world, you involve more than just my family and yours. There's the will of the people. Right? So perilous times shall come. Now look at 2 Timothy. Excuse, excuse me, 2 Chronicles. We know this. This is talking Solomon or God through Solomon talking to Israel. God's children. You need to read the whole thing. And I preached on the whole thing. But I'm not going to this morning. 2 Chronicles, verse 7, part of what he said. Second Chronicles chapter 7, God speaking to Solomon about Israel. Not doing as they were supposed to, but he said in verse 14, he said, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, 
forgive their sin, and heal their land. And there's been much talk about all of these good things that were going to happen, but there's conditions that must be met. Right? You see that? Yeah. There is no such thing and will be no such thing as national restoration without natural, national repentance. There cannot be a boasting and a glory in sin in doing the work of the devil and God bless those that will go together. 1 Kings 18. We'll show this to you in the Bible. It's a little phrase that the Lord dealt with me about about the times and the seasons. We're not going to read all of this, but you remember there was a guy, there was a prophet of God named Elijah. And you remember what Elijah had said. He had prophesied that because of the sin in the land, what did he say? There's going to be no rain nor dew for these years. Was it three years or so? How long was it? They've come to a time, as we'll look at it in a minute, they've come to a time of, of, of famine. Obviously, the famine was the result of the drought. Because you don't have rain, you don't have water, you don't have life sustenance, you're in trouble. There's a few things you need to live, and water's one of them. You can make it in this life, naturally speaking, without anything more than you can with water. You can't do without water for just a few days, and your body will you begin to get in trouble, right? So there's no rain in the land. You've got the king Ahab, his servant Obadiah, and they are going out, and, and they're desperate because everything's dying. Everything's parched. And, and they're going out looking for water. Now, Elijah didn't do anything but prophesy, which is nothing but yielding to God and being a mouthpiece for God. Elijah only said what God told him to say. Right? And, and he prophesied there's going to be no rain, no dew in the land. And then that's what happened. They got the bad way, but what they wanted to do, he wanted to do is blame the prophet of God. So he's going along and they're looking for the rain. Excuse me, they're looking for water anywhere, you know, to feed the livestock and, and such before everything dies. And if everything dies, they're going to die. They get desperate, you could say. To be honest with you, out in the world now, it's just beginning. Shock that didn't start for now. We're living in desperate times. Right? And as I told you, many people have the mentality, I'm just going to wait this out. You ain't going to wait this one out. I'm not trying to get you in fear or anything, but you're not going to wait this one out. We're going to have to trust God now. This isn't going to be waited out. So the droughts produce the famine, the lack, and of course soon death, and they're in a panic. Go down to verse 18, because this is where the problem is identified. It came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah because they didn't got the meeting. You can go back and read the whole thing for yourself. <laughs> Obadiah ran into Elijah, set up the meeting with Ahab, and Obadiah was so scared of the king, he was scared Elijah wouldn't be where he's supposed to, and he was scared that, you know, then the king would just kill him if, Eli if, if, if Elijah wasn't there. But make a long story short, obviously, Elijah honored his word, because he would have never done anything different. And Elijah showed up to meet the king. So now you got King Ahab and the prophet Elijah that has prophesied on behalf of God there's going to be no rain in the land. So in verse 17 of 1 Kings 18, this is where we're at. It came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, he said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? What's Elijah doing? He didn't do nothing but say what God said. That's the only thing he did. And then the king, who's at fault, knew to blame, he come up, this is you've got to be careful of this today because we live in a society and there's blood over everywhere. People don't take any responsibility. Everything's everybody else's fault. No, if you're wrong, you need to repent. Now, repentance is a change of mind, a change of heart that produces a change of action. There's something called fruits of repentance. You can always tell when somebody repents. Things change. Not just their words are different. Right? He said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? Talking to Elijah. In verse 18, he answered and said, I have not troubled Israel, Elijah said, but thou and thy father's house, in that you have forsaken Ahab speaking to Elijah talking to Ahab. He said, you are the troublemaker. You and your father's house, you have forsaken, left, 
the commandments of the Lord and you have followed Balaam. The problem for the drought producing the famine, producing the death of everything, if it kept going that way, was what? Elijah? No. Obadiah? No. It's the king who forsook and left God's plan and way. And I wrote this in my Bible as start and underline because it's the times we're living in that many people don't understand. But the Bible, it doesn't matter what anybody says or does. This is a truth that stands always. Individually, in the family, and in any country. Sin stops the rain. Always. It's not talked about anymore because love covers everything and everything's great. That's not true. It's not true. The church has adopted an absolute blatant lie. Sin is, has, and always will destroy the life of every person that yields to it. We're supposed to be speaking the truth of God's Word. That Jesus Christ came in this world to rescue you, to deliver you, and set you free. Not to leave you like you are. He came here with a purpose. He didn't come here just to console the brokenhearted. He came here to heal the brokenhearted. He didn't come here to medicate or to try to comfort those that are bound by the devil. He came to cast out devils and set them free. Yes, he didn't come here just to be there at the bedside when people are broken and families are suffering loss with sickness and disease. He came to lay hands on the sick and they recover. But it's just been kind of chunked in the name of everything's okay. Let's see what we can get by with. No, we need Jesus above all else. Wherever you are today, whatever you're facing today, if you've looked this world over and looked in a million places and you've not found your answer to the point and degree that you've almost given up hope, your answer is not in a program, a process, a procedure, or a place. Your answer is in the person of Jesus Christ. Yes. Jesus is the answer. Yes. Jesus is the way. We can look at it later, maybe, but in 2 Timothy 3, we didn't go there. Down in verse 5, it talked about the church and it talked about. That's, that's the bad part of that. If you look at Matthew 24, which we ministered to you before, talking about the last days and end times, that's talking about the world. When you talk about 2 Timothy chapter 3, all these things that he's talking about, most of them selfishness and all this kind of stuff, going on truce breakers, covenant breakers, all kind of stuff, that's talking to Christians. Which is a shame, but it's true. It's talking to Christians. But if you go down there a little bit further, I think it's verse 5. It says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Form is the way it looks. Form is appearance. If you want to talk about that scripture and put it in the context of church, even today, having a form of godliness. See, these things are taboo now, but homosexuality, lesbianism, all of these sorts of perversions, that's biblical, you can't get away from them. It don't matter if you get mad at me. You have to deny the Bible. You have to. You have no option. You have to deny the Bible to be for any of those things. You say, are you for those people? Of course I am. That's what I'm talking to you about. That's what's happening in the church. The church is listening to the world and embrace sin. And is looking for God to move mightily. He's not going to do it. Having a form of God in this, and it talks about, we have, we have a love, so to speak. It's really not the love of God, because the love of God embraces truth. We have a love, and we say, the church has put it on their side. We don't. But everybody is welcome. People that want help is welcome. People that want to change is welcome. Yeah. People that's come to the end of their road is welcome. End of the road of sin is welcome. We got something that will change your life. See, having a form of God in this says, come on in, we got the coffee, we got the donuts. We'll love all over you. Lick all over you. Everything's just great just like it is. That's a blatant rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ and His power. It sounds good, but it's evil. It's in families, it's destroying families. It's in churches that's destroyed them. If people say, why is the church growing and all of them shutting down? We don't believe that mess. We believe the Bible. Yes. We believe not just, we don't believe in just having a form and appearance. We're going to come in and look a certain way today and make you feel a certain way today and say everything's okay today. We're going to let you know we love you and God loves you. But there's somebody today that can change your life forever. Yes. It doesn't matter which path you've been on. It doesn't matter what all the devil's been doing in your life. We're not going to deny the power of God to change you. And that's what the church has done. Oh, we love you. Oh, but we're going to accept you just like we are because we don't believe in the Word ourselves. No, we believe in the life-changing Word of God. Yes. We believe.
believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. We believe in the anointing, which is God's power that breaks every yoke of bondage. We've seen people in this church bound by the devil come in here and get set free. I've been preparing you guys for a long time. I've been telling you, you need to be prepared for the people that come in that don't look like a suit and tie. They might not have a dress. They might come in crawling. They might come in bound. They might come in. I've had people ask me, my own children, say, what would you do if the homosexual or the lesbian comes in? What are you talking about what I do? I'm going to preach the Word of God that will set them free. We're going to teach God's Word. You don't have to be bound. You don't have to be depressed. You don't have to be down and out. You don't have to be. But see, that's how the devil operates. It's the devil that wants the church and the Christians in the name of love to embrace and accept things that are destroying people. Yes. Say, but you don't understand they're happy. Then why are they trying to change every law on the book? Why are they trying to get everybody around to accept them? Because they're not happy. It's a lie from them. It's not true. It's not true. That's why there's such a push because there's a guilt inside, and there's a reproach inside, and there's a shame inside, and they might not know what it's from. But the truth of the matter is, it's from the enemy. And Jesus is the one that will set them free. Sin stops the rain. Today, and people know. I don't know why. In this country, if you think the economic situation and the moral situation are not linked together, you're highly deceived. Just like there where the sin stopped the rain. There's things I only say by the Spirit of God because I'm very passionate about them and it makes me highly upset. So I don't say it unless the Lord leads me to. So why don't you talk about some of the different things going on? And if I get to talk about them, I might go for two hours. Because it makes me really mad. But I want to be led by the Spirit. I'm not going to say the things that I feel or that I think. I need to listen to the Spirit of God and you know what's going to set you free. Right? I want you to go. You're not going back in your notes. You're going back to mine. There's so many things you start going back. This was back, and I mentioned, I read some of it last week. Go back to Genesis 19. I didn't know what it was going to do exactly before I came in here. We are just going to follow God and figure it would be the best thing. Genesis 19. This is the Lord to give me this example. You say all oh, the church harps on this. No, I never harp on it. Never really preached about it. But if the Lord tells you to use something, you do. Because the Bible is given to you for a reason. Right? And whether anybody likes it or not, this is the handbook for Christian living. They might not understand it. Might reject it, but it's still true. It's truth regardless of what people do with it. It works. And I know it because it's truth. And I know it because it's worked in my life. Right? We're not going to go through everything. But in Genesis chapter 19, if you started in verse 1, we know... This had to do with the fate of Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom was not only known. People just focus on one thing. They were not just known for their homosexuality. They were known for their immorality in general. Blatant rejection of the Lord and His ways. And at that point, God's fed up with them. You can read it for yourself back in Genesis 18. Abraham has been interceding for the people of Sodom. Abraham was a man of God in the midst of an evil and perverse nation. Now, we want to pay attention to this. Some have been praying and interceding. I wrote this down by the Spirit of God. For family and friends in our country. I absolutely today am not telling you to stop praying. Never will. But I'm telling you it's time to make sure, this is the beginning of the year, you obey God for yourself. If you need to make a move He's leading you to make, make it. If you don't, you'll not be prepared for what's to come. If you looked up these definitions, and I did, in the Hebrew, the word Sodom means to scorch or burnt earth, and Gomorrah means a roaring heat. So together, Sodom and Gomorrah meant a scorched heat. And the Holy Spirit said, you need to prepare my people and encourage them to simply keep their faith in me. Because you are now in a time when things that have been will be no more. Sometimes, seemingly overnight. And He talked to us about misplaced trust. Don't put your faith in the world. It's system. 
Don't put your faith in your job. Put your faith in who? Put your faith in God. Look at Ezekiel. Again, this was led by the Lord because a lot of people say, well, that's the only sin they have is homosexuality. It's blatant that there was homosexuality there. That's blatant. You can't get by that. But in the Bible, in Ezekiel 16, 49 and 50, you can see the correlation of where we are today. Ezekiel 16, 49 and 50 says this. Well, the NLT. We can put it on the screen if we got it. Ezekiel 16, 49. This is what your system Sodom has done wrong. She and her daughters were proud that they had plenty of food, had peace and security. They didn't help the poor and needy. Verse 50. They were arrogant and did disgusting things in front of me. So I did away with them when I saw this. Amplified of 49 covers what was going on in Sodom. Behold, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. Pride, overabundance of food, prosperous ease, and idleness were hers and her daughters. Now if you look out into the earth today, you can see this is the state of what's going on. And ashamedly much in the church. At this moment, many would dispute it. Have no problem. Just keep watching. People have talked about the American dream for years. Get your education. Get your job. Get your family. Get your money. And you got it made. You're going to die one day. You're going to leave here one day. There's a rich fool in the Bible that did those same things. And he had plenty of wealth. And the Lord Jesus told him, Thou fool! Your soul shall be required of you this night. Because he focused on the present. He focused on what was sin. This is cursing today, especially in our society. It's one of those things that are very shocking to me. But the topic of abortion, I'm just, I just don't even know what to say. I mean, I really don't. It's, it's so blown away. I can't, I can't understand the deception. I don't understand it. Just don't. If there's a murder of a mother that's with a child, it's a double homicide. But the desire for many is even to abort a baby up to a birth in the name of a woman's right. Now I just think naturally, not even spiritually. To be hollering and screaming in the streets to commit abortion, which is murder. He said, I'll just get mad, quit, and leave. It's all right. You're going to stand before God one day. You won't thumb your nose up in hell. People think it's funny if they want to. There's a lot of stuff people think is funny today. It's not nearly as funny as they think it is. The laughing will be short-lived. It'll soon be over. It won't be near as funny as people think it is. Many people are going to answer for things. If you're visiting today, you might want to come back another day. I don't preach this way all the time, but it's the truth. And God told me to preach this way today. We need to get serious about things. It don't matter if your family and your friends and everybody's not. You better get serious with God. Billy Graham, who's dead and gone to heaven, got thousands if not millions of people saved. Made this statement. It's a quote. Billy Graham said, If God does not judge America for murdering his innocent babies, he'll have to go back in history and repent for judging Sodom and Gomorrah. You want to know the truth about it that will offend almost everybody? This country's under the judgment of God right now. The people get mad and kill stuff they want to. They've been embracing everything. You say, I'm mad, I don't want to listen. That's all right. You read your Bible, you'll be near as mad. The Holy Ghost said the church and Christians were in the place they're in for one primary reason. Two to go together, really, but it's one. They've accepted things I told them to reject. And they've rejected things that I told them to accept. God's way is the best way. They say, you don't understand these things about abortion and women's rights. No, I don't. Because I do not understand. When I would imagine that the numbers are somewhere at 50%. I would think that you're in the streets hollering and screaming for the right to abortion to end the life of an unborn child that is life at conception, by the way. Even if you don't believe that till you get to heaven, you're going to believe it one day. You stand before God. Looking for the right to murder this baby in the name of a woman's right, I'm thinking, wait a minute now. I imagine half of them is going to grow up and be women. I don't make any sense to me. So I'm standing up for women's rights to sin.
and, and at least I would imagine half, 41, 50, 51 percent are future women. How does that logic? Unpopular but true, many say, well, you don't know a lot of people are rape. Rape is sin, brings destruction. Molestation is sin, brings destruction. But two wrongs never make a right. People think that's a way out, but excuse never is. No more than if your spouse commits adultery, it gives you a right to commit one. Somebody wrongs you and sins against you doesn't give you a right to sin. There's never an excuse for sin, and you never sin and make anything better. Never. And there's testimonies everywhere. You don't hear a mainstream because that, that's not their narrative. Yeah. You don't hear nothing about that. You don't hear nothing about the people that didn't abort their children. I know so. We counsel. I could give a lady to come in here right now and call her name and everything. She'd give her testimony and can't. She had two abortions when her heart wasn't right to live for the God. For God. And she's dealt with it tremendously to this day because she realized what it is. And she speaks out, of course, in support. I said, are you pro-life or pro-choice? There's no such thing as pro-choice. You're pro-life or you're pro-death. The devil's got good words. Yeah. He's got real good words because he's a deceiver. Go to Genesis 19. We need an examination like never before. Many want the church and the move of God like it used to be. All the while compromising the gospel. He only confirms the gospel. He didn't confirm what I like or what I want or what I agree with. Amen? So you have to love everybody. You don't know what you're talking about, Pastor. The other. You don't. Because it's love and truth. It's not one or the other. You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. You love people, but you speak the truth to get them out of bondage. There are Christians, even though ministers, that go in defense of these same topics. Say, so what do you think about it? They'll answer for it. They might not answer to me, but they're going to answer for it. Because people's lives are at stake. Lives are at stake. They say, I have no hesitation in ministering to these things because we pray we've got many people set free. The dumbest thing you can do is embrace those things. That's the worst thing you can do in the name of love. Because you do not love those people. That's deception. If you love somebody, you do anything you can to get them set free. You do anything you can to get them out of bondage. Anything you can to get them out of the dumb, so to speak. Anything you can. That's what Jesus did. People preach these messages, so cute messages. Jesus hung out with the sinners in the church. The only thing to do is sin. That's a lie from hell. Jesus didn't hang out with sinners. When Jesus was in the presence of sinners, it was not for the purpose of hanging out. He brought the very presence of God into their presence. Gave them an opportunity to have a life they would have never had any other way. He was a vessel of God by the Spirit that changed people. He wasn't hanging out on the basketball court or hanging out at the ball game. That's ignorant. <coughs> the church is supposed to be fulfilling the Great Commission. Yeah. That's what you and I are here for. Yeah. It's what we're going to preach, teach, and live. Again, lay hands on the sick and they recover. Yeah. Right? Genesis 19. They received instruction. We've received instruction. Verse 12. And the men said unto Lot, Has there here any besides, son-in-law, and thy sons, and thy daughters? And whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. Well, are you mad right now? I'll tell you what. We just follow the Holy Ghost. You can be angry if you want to. But it's because of the sin you've embraced. It's not because you're listening to me preach this morning. So what are you doing? It's arrested by the Spirit of God. You hang on to and embrace things that not only destroy you, destroy other people. Yes. God doesn't find it funny. And He doesn't wink at it, the Bible says. It's not funny. There's people you can love on and hug on and embrace all you want to. There's only one answer and one cure for them. And if it's me, I'd be in the same situation. It's to get on your knees and repent before God. Yes. And don't get up until you're changed. Because He will change you. You might want to talk to him before you talk to me about anything. You don't want to talk to me anyways about that way in that area because I know what the Word says and not just in the Old Testament. From Genesis to Revelation. You want to know the truth about it because we preach the truth there. Jesus came to give life and life more abundantly. Homosexuality, lesbianism, and abortion are acts of Satan 
against the life that God gave through Jesus. Because no two men and to, no two women can produce a child. That's a lie from hell. And abortion is snuffing out a life. Not, not spiritual because they live in heaven. But still, murder. No, we, don't, we don't preach those things anymore. That's right. And then the same people cry because God's not moving to the church. The same people cry because they say, I don't understand why hardly nobody comes to church. Because nobody needs to go to church to hear somebody lie all the time. Amen. This is what the Bible says. What I feel and think won't change your life. If I can't back it up with the Scriptures, it's not right. It's perverting the Gospel. And again, we love everybody, but we embrace the truth that can change and alter the course of their lives forever. God's Word can change you. Yes. Amen? Amen? You say, you, you mercy out all the time, I'll be honest with you. I don't know the last time that happened like it just did. Years. Is there somebody here that you're just about seething? But I want you to understand something. The Spirit of God's dealing with you because you're wrong. Amen. You better stop going that way. Because what's been done privately is going to be exposed publicly and the pie is not going to be on my face nor God's. Amen. This is my notebook right here. God's plan for your prosperity the law of sowing and reaping allows my preachers this morning. And I've studied it out in great detail. And it's helped me and it's true. And it would help people. But the Lord told me yesterday evening to preach this message this morning. God knows what you need. Not always what you want, but it's what you need. Embrace the truth of God's Word. Don't embrace what this world is telling. Don't embrace what the majority of the church. The Lord told me probably 10 years ago. You've heard me say it repeatedly. American Christianity is not biblical Christianity. It's evolved into what people wanted it to be. We just close on good stuff today. Is that all right with y'all? Look at 1 Corinthians 10. Because we want to go over to the New Testament. I'll give you these couple and send you home dancing in the Holy Ghost. So you believe in all that stuff? I sure do. I believe in the move of God. You say, you believe me and fill with the Holy Ghost speaking other tongues? The Lord gave me a set time. I don't tell you because it's not a comparison with you. You do what God tells you to do. You don't have to do what God tells you to do. I spend time praying in the Holy Ghost seven days a week. Every day. To get my day started. A certain amount of time. Why? Because every answer you need is in the Spirit. It ain't in the world or the flesh anyways. And it ain't on Facebook or social media. It's in the Spirit. Yes. So do you believe in the move of God mightily? We're entering into one, but you can't have it without the truth. You can't. It'll never exist. You might can conjure something up, but it won't change lives. It won't. And we preach and teach and pray for a move of the Spirit. But right, right up this driveway, probably six months ago, praying and God moved in a measure, and I was so grateful. And I was just saying to myself, I was in the car with Arlene, I do a couple of Arlene all the time, but this time I was just thank you to myself as I was riding off as I do sometimes. I said, Lord, I thank God for what you did. I thank God lives were changed, but I know there's more. This is what he said. He said, son, obedience to my word always takes precedence. He said, there's no such thing as a move of the Spirit that is a substitute for obedience to the word. He said, always remember, preach the word first. Our foundation is the word of God. Every day, right? 1 Corinthians 10. No. Yeah, it is. 1 Corinthians 10. This is the New Testament. Better covenant based upon better promises. Look at verse 1. I'll give you these couple and then I'm going to let you go. Dance and shout and if you need to, repent. So I don't think we ought to talk about that no more. Well, just be honest with you. If, if you get in your word, you get a different viewpoint. Repentance is called a gift. It's a gift. Anybody ever sinned and missed it? If you love God and you've ever sinned, you know repentance is a gift. It's a blessing that I can say, God, I missed it. Your way is the right way. My way is the wrong way. I ask you to forgive me. I thank you for the blood of Jesus. Yes. Repentance is a gift. You got off track. You can get back on. We're not giving you no hope. But you got to start out with the truth. You got nothing. Talk about Israel. Verse 1, 10. 1 Corinthians. Moreover, brother, it would not that you should be ignorant. Having all our fathers run to the cloud and all passed through the sea, were all baptized under Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And did all eat the same spiritual meat. All drink the same spiritual drink. For the drink of that spiritual rock that followed them. That rock was Christ. The rock is Christ. Yes. yes, church. But with many of them, God was not well pleased. The people say today, God's accepted me, and, and you're accepted in the beloved. That's in Ephesians 1. That's biblical. But God can accept you as a child and not accept and be pleased with everything you do. 
You understand that? That's, that's been divorced today's Christian life. I can be, you ever had your children? Anybody got children? You love them down or what? You ever loved them and not been pleased with everything they did? You ever loved them and even pulled them aside and told them, listen, I love you, and I'm telling you this because I love you. You keep doing that, it's going to cause you problems. Well, God's a good father. And He does the same thing to us. He tries to cut off destruction in our life. He does not leave us in a destruction. That's a good thing about God. He doesn't just say you're in a mess. He says, hey, I'm right here to help you. I'll get you out if you look to me. Yes. Right? Kate McVeigh, who was a minister, I don't know anything about her now. I think she's still ministering. I listened to her one time out at Raymond Camp meeting. And she said one thing about it. doesn't matter how you got in the pit. He said, she said some people got pushed in. Some people walked around and slipped in because they stayed too close. And then I could say this. You could too if you tell the truth. She said some of them was like me. Jonathan can say the same thing. We jumped in. She said, it doesn't matter how you got in the pit when you get down there and you realize, this ain't where I need to be. This ain't where I'm supposed to be. If you call out to God, yeah. He meets you. Yeah. Right? But He was not well pleased. They were overthrown in the wilderness. Everything the children of Israel dealt with in the wilderness was unnecessary. They didn't believe God and didn't trust Him. These things were for our examples. If it's for an example for us, and the Bible says so, we should do it. Follow that example to the intent that we should not lust after evil things is they also lusted today. It is celebrate to do what you feel. What's the little saying? You do you. That was the one probably a year or two ago. They probably got ten more now. I don't keep up with all of them. I just hear the children talking. No, you don't do you. You do Jesus. I'm crucified with Christ. Galatians 2.20 I've come to the end of my life. I'm not living for me. The world, the flesh, and the devil. I'm living for God. I've been bought and paid for the price. Yes, amen. People say, my body, my choice. That's the equivalent of saying I'm not a Christian. It's not your body or your choice. That's not true. Yes. Not if you're a Christian. You've been bought and paid for with a price. And just as you're following Jesus, He said, not my will, but your will be done, Father. What are you saying? Not what I want, but God's will. I don't care what everybody else is doing. As for me and my house, we're following the Lord. But Galatians 2.20 said, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me the life which I now live in the flesh. I live how? By faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. The Word will change your life. This, this is much what happened. I'm going through all verse 7. Neither be ye idolaters. As were some. The people say, we don't have the idols like they did today. But like they did back then. The truth of the matter is, an idol is anything you put ahead of God or put in His place. As were some of them, as it were, written, the people sat down to eat and drink and what? Rose up to play. Let's just have fun. Sounds good till the end of the game comes. Neither let us commit fornication. And some of them committed. And God said it was okay. But I love you anyways. This is the New Testament. Neither let them commit fornication. Let's commit fornication on them committed and fell one day, three and twenty thousand. Does that sound like approval to you? Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Why? Because they tempted Christ. Neither murmur. This will give you a new idea about complaining and griping. And the more you gripe and complain, it's identi it identifies how much of the flesh you're in instead of the spirit. And they were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happen to them for examples. And they are written for our admonition. Upon whom the ends of the world are come. Let him thinketh, let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. Last scripture for today, which is not all of my message, but it's alright. Y'all ready to go because you already had enough. You barely got started, but it doesn't matter. If I was to get mad at anybody, that's why I tell people, you leave me alone, please stay away from me. But number one, I'm going to live by the word. Don't bring no such foolishness because I don't want to hear nothing about it. Revelation chapter 2, the hell of a mess we're in is because many people that should have rejected this foolishness have embraced it. There's a lot of unnecessary suffering because the church is more worldly than it is godly. And we talking to me about all this stuff. If you make me want to choke you, no, I ain't going to do it because I'm walking in the love of God. But you have Christians standing up for stuff. My God, have mercy. They don't need to be standing up for it. 
Pride goes before destruction, the Holy Spirit before fall. Revelation chapter 2. I'm going to leave you with this before you get your fried chicken. Jesus talking to the seven churches of Thyatira in verse 19, Revelation 2, under the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, his feet are like fine brass. Thank God he commends us where we're right. He said, I know thy works, charity, love, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Now we could just dance if he stopped there, but he didn't stop. This is one of these ones you need a definition in. This world and much of the church embraces the idea of tolerance and acceptance. It's blatant sin. I said it's sin. I can't believe that people have no more sense of that in the church. It's sin to embrace wrong in the name of love. Yes. This is what he says. Jesus said, isn't it red? Yes. If, you, if it's not red, you might need to get another Bible. It says, notwithstanding in verse 20, I have a few things against thee. Because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess. To, this is the thing she was doing to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. He said, I have a few things against thee because thou sufferest. You know what that word means in the Greek? It means to let be. There are certain things we let be we shouldn't let be. It means to permit. There are certain things that have been permitted and allowed. We should have not been permitted at all. To allow one to do as he wishes, the Thayer says. To allow one to do as he wishes, to not restrain. Same word is over in Acts 27 we use all the time when Paul's in the storm and they just gave up and they let her drive. I told you, when you let her drive, you're in trouble. I'm about to let you go. But they let her drive. They just let her go. No restraint. Whichever way it blows, that's the way most people's lives have been in much of the church. That word also means in the Greek to tolerate. In the cross reference it means toleratest. Tolerance and acceptance is always sin and brings destruction. You love everybody, but you never embrace sin. The Lord Jesus said, I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. And you know what happened? Destruction came, just like in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. People say the church shouldn't be that way today. Well, God didn't know it, neither did Paul. We've got to take a stand, not against people, but for God like never before. We've got to be serious about walking with Him like never before. He's told me different things recently, even by the Spirit, that I never saw it that way. Because we've done this in the name of love. There are many times that you won't allow things in your life because you know it's not right. But in the name of love, even the people around you, you've allowed and permitted. You say, I can't stop them. I'm not talking about you being able to stop everybody from doing everything. But you don't apologize for having a standard of God's Word in your life. The Lord told me this. We know we're not to yield to the flesh and just do what we want to do because we're to live lives pleasing to God. But the Lord spoke to me one day. Never thought about it this way. And He said, you know, you're not supposed to just not yield to your flesh. You're not supposed to yield to nobody else's either. I never saw that. Does that make sense to you? Say, so I know I'm not going to go this way, but I get close to somebody that I'm supposed to be walking with and in fellowship, and they're yielding to the flesh, bringing destruction, and I just allow what they're doing to define and dictate what I'm doing. That's wrong. You've got to make a stand for God. Do what's right, and God will honor it every step of the way. This is a necessary message that is necessary for the move of God. You know that. Jesus is the answer. Stand to your feet. Jesus is the way. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Many think He's changed. But He had not He had not changed. But the Bible talks about another. They said in the church of Corinth, false teachers had come in and they said, now you've got another Jesus. You've got another gospel. You've got another spirit. Different Holy Spirit. There's a, the Satan operates in the realm of counterfeit. The only answer is Jesus. I'm not against one person in this world this day. My family knows this. and Anybody close to me knows it. I don't. The Bible says Christians are not to strive. It means to quarrel or to fight. I don't fight with anybody. I love everybody. You can come against me. You can do all sorts of things. It wouldn't make any difference. I wouldn't even respond to you. Just keep right on going. I love you either way. But you can believe that no matter what you do, it's not going to change what I believe. Because what I believe is written 
been red and black and white. And that's what will set you free. God is for us. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Father, we come before you today. We love you and thank you for this day. You many blessings. You told me many years ago before I ever ministered a message, don't worry about it. In and everything that I need, I want to do the work of the ministry that I have. You've led me down ways, paths, and plans that I never thought I would go, even up to this day. Never intended on ministering this message. But before I ever come out here, when I spend time in prayer, I'm aware that you're the only person that knows the people that are near me. That knows the people under the sound of my voice. I know you're the only one who knows that. So the only way I can be effective is to listen to the Spirit. Now, as I minister this today, I couldn't stand up here and say, well, I know this is for thus and so, that one or the other. Well, I don't know that. But I just know and believe that I've obeyed you. The Word has been delivered. And I pray, Father, that the people in this place, whether they like me or not, you know, I know different people like different personalities. That's great and fine. But I pray that they ask themselves, was that God speaking this morning? Is that in line with the Word? And if so, if they need to make adjustments, they'll make them. So the blessings can flow. The glory can flow. The anointing can flow. And the plan of God can be fulfilled in their life. Every head bowed and every eye closed. You're here today and you say, Pastor, I don't know this Jesus is Lord and Savior of my life. I don't know I'm in the family of God. I don't know I'm one of His children. I don't know today if I took my last breath. I don't know that I'd go to heaven. You can know. You can know this day, no matter how you came, you can leave there changed. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you'll be saved for whoever calls upon His name will be saved. Jesus is the way, not just for now, but for the hereafter. There's a heaven to gain and a hell to show. You're here today and you say, Pastor, that's me. I want you to pray with me to give my heart and life to the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. Without hesitation, I want you to boldly slip your hand up on a prayer before we leave. Anybody in the place? Anybody? Number two, you say, I'm a Christian. I have no doubt. But I got out of fellowship with God. But I'm ready to come back home. Thank God, as we said earlier, the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if you confess that you sin, well, God is faithful and just to cleanse you and forgive you of your sins in all unrighteousness. In other words, you say, God, your way is the right way. My way is the wrong way. I ask you to forgive me and cleanse me. And He'll do just that. Your sins and your iniquities will be remembered no more. There's no sin so great that the blood of Jesus can't wash it away. You're here today and you say, I want you to pray with me, Pastor. To be dedicated and commit my life to God. This day, before I leave, slip your hand up boldly. Anybody in the place? Anybody? God is with us. You got any special needs? You can come down now. That they all be glad to pray with you. You don't have to push it off by no reason. I'm just making this as an announcement. Obviously, Wednesday night, we have the healing service. And people will say, what, that, what is that? We minister the Word along the lines of healing. And then we lay hands on the sick. We've seen people set free. Seen people healed. And it's just beginning. God's moving mighty. That's right, I'll do that. You come up here. We didn't forget about it. Yes. Y'all stretch your hands this way. You got somebody to help? You got a supporter? Yes. But Tommy's having total knee replacement in the morning. We believe it's going perfectly. Supernatural.